Hey guys, welcome to our lesson on gynecology. Let's go ahead and review the topics that we'll be discussing throughout this lesson, and then we'll get into the components that we'll deal with for our introduction. Let's we'll go ahead and get started. Topics for this lesson include the anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive organs, the menstrual cycle, the assessment of the gynecological patient, management of gynecological emergencies, and specific gynecological emergencies and their treatments. In this lesson, for introduction, we'll be talking primarily about the anatomy and physiology along with the menstrual cycle. Let's go ahead and get started. When we think about gynecology, we have to recognize that gynecology is a branch of medicine that deals with the maintenance and disease of women, primarily dealing with their sexual uh, and reproductive organs. Uh, most patients that you will encounter will be experiencing either some sort of abdominal pain or vaginal bleeding. And so normally we're going to be called because there was some type of problem that exists. Let's dive deeper into the anatomy and physiology of those reproductive organs. When we think about repro reproductive organs for both men and women, I always like to say that women are fancy on the inside and men are fancy on the outside. But there is a little bit more to it than that. When we deal with the anatomy of the female reproductive organs, we deal with both internal and external genitalia. The internal genitalia are the most common ones that we deal with in regards for reproduction, along with the components of things like the ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, or vagina. We'll talk more about those organs as we get through this lesson and then into our OB lesson as well. The external genitalia, the vulva and the penendium, are going to be primarily accessory functions, protecting body, body openings such as the urethra um, or the um, vaginal canal itself, or they have a role that's important for sexual functions. Some of the key things that we're going to pay close attention to when we're looking at um, our external genitalia are going to be primarily focusing on um, the perineum. Uh, that will be the first component. Perineum is located here, right? It's just ba at the, from the base of the vaginal opening to the beginning of the anus. Um, this is an area where you typically may see things like tears or what we refer to as an episiotomy. And it's just muscular tissue that separates the, vaginal, uh, the vagina from the uh, anus. The other area that we look for is going to be the mons pubis. pubis. This is going to be the um, area of, of um, fatty layer of tissue over the top of the pubic symphysis. And this area is going to be primarily um, uh, allowing for us to recognize and locate the anatomical structure of the mons pubis um, or the pubic symphysis bone. We also deal with the labia. The labia is divided into labia majora and labia minora. These again are going to be primarily protective structures to help protect um, any type of cavity or opening. The clitoris, this is vascular erect um, tissue that lies anterior to the labia minora. Um, this is tissue that in males become a penis and in females become the clitoris. It's also referred to as a prepuce. Um, the urethra, the urethra is where the urine is going to come from the bladder. Um, we know that it's much shorter in females, only about four to five centimeters. Um, and because of that decrease in length, uh, we see an increase in things like infection, urinary tract infections, things of that nature. The vagina this is the birth canal um, itself, right? It's the female organ for copulation. Um, it's going to be the outlet for menstruation, and it's only 9 to 10 centimeters in length. Um, so maybe that can answer the question if size matters or not. <laughs> the uterus, now on the other hand, is going to be um, the site for fetal development. It's one of the primary organs we think about for fetal development. Um, uh, out of its locations, you're going to see that you're primarily going to have two uh, areas to it. The top two-thirds of it is going to be smooth muscle layers. Um, at the top of the uterus, right where the fundus would be, and then the lower portion, which we refer to as the neck of the cervix, the lower third, uh, or just the cervix itself. Um, and this is usually going to be uh, important for us because uh, we're going to be able to measure the height um, from the mons pubis symphys all the way up to the height of the fundus, and that's going to allow for us to determine weeks of gestation as we measure uh, in centimeters. Each centimeter is equal to one week. Again, we'll talk more about that in our OB lecture. The fallopian tubes, the fallopian tubes are going to be the areas that collect and transport the eggs um, from the ovium, down, from the ovary down into the uterus. Um, this is typically where fertilization occurs. Most people think that fertilization actually occurs inside of the uterus, and that's not the case. It actually happens most likely in the fallopian tube. It's also important to know that the fallopian tube is not actually directly connected to the ovaries. Um, and so what ends up happening here is that you can see these little whisper-like features here, a little pen light, these whisper-like fingers here, which actually will draw the egg up and down and through the fallopian tube. Um, we'll talk more about this, but things like uh, pelvic inflammatory disease um, or PID or uh, scar tissue that may have developed from inner uterine de um, devices 
Uh, it can lead to ectopic pregnancies. And again, this is an area that's very high in vascularity. Uh, ovaries, on the other hand, now we're talking about um, uh, the female gonads. Uh, and these are going to be controlled by two primary hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And we'll talk more about those in a little bit as well. The uterus now itself provides a site for fetal development like we had talked about. Um, the biggest issues that we're dealing with here are going to be the two primary locations, the upper portion and the lower portion. The top portion is also referred to as the corpus or the body of the, of, of the uh, 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 uterus. Lost my wording there for a second. Uterus, right? So you got to think about it like this pear-shaped organ. The top portion up here is going to be your um, uh, body, and then down towards the base of that, where it kind of comes down together, that's going to be your your cervix or your neck. Um, the cervix is actually going to dilate. It's going to get bigger, and it's going to, to a face, which means it's going to get thinner until it will rupture. And at that point, when it ruptures, we get the breaking of water, uh, and uh, we know that delivery at that point is somewhere in the near future. Now, the um, uterus itself has uh, three different layers of tissue that we primarily are going to deal with. The first one is going to be the uh, endometrium, right? Then we have the myometrium and the perimetrium. The biggest one that we think about is going to be the endometrium because that's a tissue that becomes engorged with blood. That's a tissue that will slough off as part of menstruation. Um, it's also the area that's going to provide adequate blood supply to the placenta and then to the fetus. And so we know that if that organ becomes damaged by any means, it's going to lead to a significant amount of bleeding because of the increase in vascularity and then most likely death to the fetus. So we have to keep those things in mind if we're dealing with someone who might be possibly pregnant. The menstrual cycle. Uh, we always get some kind of funny comments in class about the menstrual cycle, but here it is. Um, I do know quite a bit about the menstrual cycle. Uh, I am not experienced firsthand by any means, but I can talk to you about what it exists uh, from anatomy and physiology level. So what is the menstrual cycle? Well, it's a, it's a regular 28-day cycle um, that's controlled by hormones. Um, we see that based on the hormone estrogen and the hormone progesterone. It's going to uh, influence its uh, release of those um, estrogen and progesterone by both uh, follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH. Um, and then that's going to affect our anterior pituitary gland, which is going to release those hormones, and that's going to allow for the body, in essence, to prepare to receive a fertilized egg. And so we know that as this cycle prepares, we have this phase of it's preparing for a ovium to be fertilized and for it to implant itself on the uterine wall. Um, now, the onset of, of menses, also known as menarche, um, usually develops the, between the ages of 10 and 14, sometimes earlier, sometimes a little bit later, just depends on the individual. Um, the key thing here is at that point in time, there's a potential that they could be bearing child. So even though they may be 10, you have a child who's suffering from abdominal pain that may be potentially able to have um, uh, be pregnant. You want to ask if they're sexually active and if there's any chance that they might be pregnant. It's one of the most common reasons for abdominal pains in the female patient. Um, and then we have the other end of the extreme, which is menopause, right? That's where we stop the process of menstruation. Um, it can also happen anywhere in the life cycle based on um, surgical menopause, either a partial or total hysterectomy. Now, there's four primary phases that we deal with with the menstrual cycle. We have the proliferative phase, the pro-life phase, the secretory phase, the ischemic phase, and then the menstrual phase. Let's take a look at those individually. The proliferative phase uh, is primarily going to be the first two weeks of the menstrual cycle, and it's going to be dominated by estrogen, which is going to cause the uterus um, to uh, gradually thicken and become engorged with blood. Um, this is going to be in response to LH at approximately uh, day 14. Uh, ovulation will occur. That's where we have the release of the egg, and that's when that will take place. Now, at birth, each female ovaries, uh, or each female um, contain ovaries, yeah, contain about 200,000 ovium or 200,000 eggs, right, within the uh, immature ovarian follicle. Um, and these are going to be where there's their lifetime supply of eggs. So you only get to think about this, when, when, when you're thinking about how long you have to have children, you do have a limited amount of eggs as a female that you can release, but it's still 200,000. Um, and that's um, usually over a lifetime that's going to be gradually used up. Now, we also know that in response to the follicle-stimulating hormone, an increase in estrogen levels, um, once during the menstrual cycle, a follicle reaches, uh, uh, where it's, it's mature, and it's going to actually rupture and develop itself into what's called a corpus luteum. Um, and the corpus luteum is going to be the actual egg itself, um, which is going to be a small yellowish body of cells um, that are going to be there uh, waiting for um, the egg to be fertilized. Now, if the egg is fertilized, then the body maintains hormones 
Um, it will help um, uh, produce, the corpus luteum will actually produce progesterone until the placenta takes over uh, as its primary organ uh, for life. Now, if that, ha if that does not happen, um, we end up seeing that uh, the endometrium sheds and we go through the normal process of menstruation. Uh, earlier, I was talking about those fingery whispers, right? These are called cilia. They're fine hair-like structures. Um, they're on the, from branded ends of the fallopian tubes. And they actually draw the egg in, right, and to the tube and then sweep it towards the uterus. So anyone that's had issues with um, uh, sexual intercourse within approximately 24 hours of, fertile, uh, of ovulation, fertilization is likely. Um, so it can take place. So 24 hours, folks, you can still get pregnant later. Um, just something to kind of think about. Now, if the egg is fertilized, the normal is going to plant on the uterine wall, like we've talked about, um, and then it's going to go and um, it's going to have a thickened lining of the uterus, um, where we're going to see the uterus uh, subsequently develop. Um, and if it's not fertilized, it passes into the uterine cavity and then is expelled as tissue, which takes us into our next phase here, which we talked. Ah, we talked about the majority of these things already. The next thing we look at is the secretory phase. This is the stage of menstruation cycle immediately surrounding ovulation, and it's referred to as the secretory phase. Um, if the egg is not fertilized, the woman's estrogen levels go <laughs> drop right off, uh, while progesterone levels <laughs> are going to dominate. Uh, and so we see things like uterine vascularity increase during this phase in anticipation of the uh, implementation of a fertilized egg. Now, if the fertilization does not occur, that takes us to the ischemic phase. Uh, if fertilization doesn't occur, estrogen and progesterone levels are going to fall off, and that's going to lead to a number of vascular changes. Those vascular changes um, cause the endometrium to become pale, um, and small blood vessels begin to actually rupture, and that's what leads us into the next phase, which is the menstrual phase. Now, during the menstrual phase, the ischemic endometrium is shed. So we're talking about shedding of the uterine line, along with the discharge of blood, mucus, um, uh, and cellular debris. Again, that process is known as menstruation. Now, a normal menstruation cycle depends on a regular pattern uh, in the individual woman. Each woman is going to be a little bit different. This is going to vary from woman to woman. Um, an average blood loss is going to be about 50 milliliters uh, is, is common. Um, uh, the absence of a menstrual period in any woman in childbearing years, again, typically talking about 12 to 55 who are sexually active and whose periods are usually regular, uh, it should raise some suspicion that they may be pregnant. But not everybody is uh, as alert or pays that close attention to this. Um, now, since some women mark, uh, regularly experience and marked physical signs and symptoms uh, that we deal with, we also refer to those as um, PMS or premenstrual syndrome, right? And so PMS syndrome includes things like breast tenderness, um, engorgement, transient weight loss or gain, bloating as a result of fluid retention, excessive fatigue, cravings of specific foods. Uh, females are more prone to migraine headaches during this time um, as well. And other women may have uh, only minimal physical symptoms, right? Uh, but but, uh, but are, some are, have more physical, some have more emotional uh, responses such as irritability, anxiety, or even things like depression. Now, the severity of the PMS is really going to depend on each individual and may require treatment focused based on uh, primarily just relief of their symptoms, mitigating headaches, mitigating cramping, things of that nature. Um, one of the other things that we typically can see here is premenstrual uh, dysphoric disorder, which is um, PMDD. This is a similar condition in which women has a severe symptoms of depression, irritability, uh, and tension before menstruation. The symptoms of PMDD are more severe than those uh, with uh, other premenstrual symptoms, including things like a wide range of physical or emotional symptoms that can be typical. Um, and usually five to 11 days before the woman actually starts her monthly cycle. Um, and then she'll start it thereafter. So you got to remember that with PMDD, it's a little bit more severe uh, outside of the normal functions, and it happens earlier as well. Um, now, menopause is a little bit different. And now we're talking about the stopping of menses. In this case, we're talking um, the ovarian function uh, and the estrogen secretion is stopping. And because of that, the menstrual periods generally uh, occur, but they're going to happen uh, up until about age 45 to 55, and then from that point on, they're going to slowly start to decrease um, over time, right, in frequency and in length until eventually they have a complete stop. Now, the idea behind this, again, is it's going to be the end of reproductive life as the woman ultimately knows it. Um, and because we know we all have a limited amount of, of uh, eggs to be released, 
um, that can become a concern. We also are going to see occasionally uh, physicians who will use the term surgical menopause, which basically means that the women's period has stopped based on the fact that they've had some type of partial or total hysterectomy or a removal of some type of the reproductive organs. Um, it is not uncommon for hormone replacement therapy to be done as well, either oral estrogen or estrogen and progesterone co combos um, that can be prescribed to help maintain uh, their normal balance um, of, of hormones uh, as they try to manage those out. And those are going to be the primary three big ones that you look at, uh, oral uh, estrogen, uh, estrogen and progesterone. And so I'm going to go ahead and stop here as far as our introduction into anatomy and physiology uh, and talking about the menstrual cycle. Uh, the next lesson that we'll get into is going to be the assessment of the gynecological patient and then treatments thereof. Let's go ahead and get into those.